This is uh, three different stories from the book God uh, commanded and directed uh, how I type it. Every word is his, every sentence, every page, every chapter, every... Well, there's two books, both books. It's all his. And he taught me the material first. He always made it difficult, but he also made it as... Always made me feel like I was a part of it. An actual writer. Uh, even though it was all coming from him. At his command and direction. Uh, Orthodox Judaism, they... they like to say God dictated the Torah to Moses. I wouldn't call it uh, what he does with me, straight dictation. But it's definitely at his command direction and a good bit of his dictation. Uh, but the first thing I want to address is the prophet like Moses. Now again, God comes from Adam and of the peoples none are with him. The peoples, that's the Jewish people. Who is his representation then? It has to be a Gentile. And he's coming from, Adam is considered, uh, uh, it was in G Gentile lands. It's where uh, it would fall within Jordan today if it was still in existence. Coming from Adam, he's coming from Gentile lands. And Adam is associated with Christianity uh, because of Rome. Um, and Adam, Edomites, are descendants of Esau, the brother of Jacob, who became Israel. Because all he did was marry uh, non-Israeli uh, women. And so all of his children were Gentiles. This is, uh, you know, I didn't... Well, there's some, <laughs> any events from Exodus, I'm pretty sure. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet from among the people, like myself. Him you shall heed. This is just what you ask of the Lord your God at Oreb on the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear the voice of the Lord my God any longer, or see the wondrous fire any more, lest I die. Whereupon the Lord said to me, and this is, he's talking to me as Moses, they have done well in speaking to us. I will raise up a prophet for them from among their own people like yourself. I will put my words in his mouth and he will speak to them all that I command him. Just real quick, I will put my words in his mouth. He's not talking about teaching him what to go say, per se. Uh, when you are a man in divine beings as Moses is, uh, which I can point out in several different places, because anytime God comes to you, the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit, who is a person uh, in a divine being, is with him. You know, angel of his presence, <laughs> his spirit. My spirit is always with me and within me. I guess my spirit's in me and I'm in my spirit, encased in this body. God says, because I saw that too, when, we, when he was first teaching me Torah, and I said, well, I, I'm, you keep calling me the prophet like Moses. I said, I know, I speak to you face to face. We talk friend to friend, just like him and Moses. And uh, and I have written two books for you. We just went over this again for this video. And I, I, I wrote the two books for you. So, I mean, there's no question I'm doing the things that Moses did. But I'm not, I, but I'm not Jewish. Uh, I am his representation from Gentile lands. Uh, uh, and again, not, none of his people were with him. None of the chosen. None of the Jews. So... Clearly, had to be a Gentile. It's not the first time there's been a Gentile Moshiach. So was Cyrus of Persia. Um, Elijah. Elijah is a Gentile. He's a Tishbite, an inhabitant of Ramoth Gilead. Ramoth Gilead is above Adam, but it's still east of the River Jordan. Uh, it would be in the country Jordan today, 
and it was uh, Arab and Assyrian lands. They were always fighting over it, apparently quite beautiful. But he's an inhabitant, and you didn't do that back then. You didn't find any Israelites going and living amongst Arabs or and or Assyrians, unless you wanted to be a slave. <laughs> you know, it just didn't, ha or dead. It just didn't happen. He's an inhabitant, and God makes that clear. He keeps calling him the Tishbite, the Tishbite. Uh, and there's no clan of Tishbites in any of the tribes that you can find. Now, I'll grant you this. Not every tribe has a genealogical record. In Chronicles, of course, we have a lot from uh, Kings 1 and 2, Samuel 1 and 2, uh, and, and in Samuel with the kings of Judah, but uh, no clan called Tishbite. It's just not there. And and this guy just telling you, what do you think? Well, he's a Gentile. And as a matter of fact, when God takes him up, when God takes him up uh, in the chariots of God to heaven and his body disappears, he had crossed over the Jordan. He was on the east side of it. Uh, so he was in uh, where, <laughs> again, the country Jordan is today. He was taken up in um, Gentile lands. And he was a Gentile. And I am also handling all of his tasks. I am considered Elijah. God has taught me everything of heaven you could possibly want to know or need to know or could understand in vision and by his words and in his power. Um, I am Elijah who really since if I don't get done what I'm supposed to get done primarily clear the way for the Lord and be his messenger of the new covenant and recounsel the sons to the father and the fathers to the sons by being mindful of God's laws that he gave Moses at Oreb in other words make them righteous same purpose as Isaiah 53, where it says, for a purpose of God that might prosper. Well, it doesn't tell us in Isaiah 53 what the purpose is. Well, you find out in Malachi, his purpose is, I'm returning to my temple, and we don't have it ready for him. It's not there. Okay, and now he knew it wasn't going to be there. If you look at the covenant of friendship that comes with Moshe, who God calls David, my servant David, a shepherd. Does not call him King Moshe. Does not say there'll be a kingdom established. Does not say he'll rule basically the world or all the Middle East. That, there's nothing in there. He's just a shepherd and he's appointed as uh, uh, all other shepherds, rabbis, are dismissed. And I am the only one he recognizes as Moshe, as a shepherd. And I'm not a rabbi, though. When I usually say rabbi, uh, shepherd, I think rabbi. And, and I should. You know, the leaders over the flock. But uh, for me, I don't use the term, I don't want to use that. It means teacher. But uh, I'm a shepherd, and I'll be teaching the matters that you have found on these uh, YouTubes uh, throughout the rest of my life, uh, and along with my experiences with God, and try to get people to understand him and his personality in greater, uh, uh, greater detail. Because I mentioned this before, uh, the first people to read his writings or to hear it read to them more likely uh, was in antiquity. And he had to have a certain persona for the times. And in those times, people felt God's, God was always angry. And the concept of a spirit within you going to a spiritual heaven and being with God just wasn't there. That's why you have so much resurrection of the dead. And it was also because they had no medicine, uh, knowledge of, of medicine and science. You know, we know today you cannot take dust and form a human being. That includes God. God said, now, I could have made human beings something so different than what you know that there could be a resurrection, but they still wouldn't have gone to dust. I'd have made sure of that. But we, you know, he says, what I have is perfect. Uh, but anyway, the bottom line is we know there's no resurrection of the dead. I know it to be fact because it's supposed to happen when I arrive. And it, 
<laughs> when Moshe had come, he was supposed to have the resurrection of the dead. Well, you better hope not. I don't know that you can even fit them into the square <laughs> square mileage of the Israel, much less take care of them. Can you imagine just the, Is the Israelites who were in Egypt for 400 years? You know how many people that was? I mean, I don't exactly. I know 600,000 left with Moses, men. That's not counting women and children. Well over a million, I'm sure. What are you going to do with those people? They were savage. In a savage time. Uh, totally ignorant. No school. They wouldn't understand anything. And he had to take care of them. That's just that group. And you've got the Holocaust, six million. You've got everybody between the Exodus and the Holocaust. Now you got everybody some 70 years later after the Holocaust. You know, and, and scientifically, in, in medicine, everything, we know it can't be done. It's not going to be done. But anyway, prophet like Moses, I'm a Gentile. But who, but, but, but what Gentile? The descendant of King David, one of the greatest Israelites ever. And God considers me Israelite. And God is not bound by the laws of man or the laws of the Jews. Period. He says, that's for y'all. I'm not bound by anything. I am God. That's how he, that's how he sees things. God. If I say you're an Israelite, is it any different than I, 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 I had it written that uh, uh, you, are, <laughs> you are now Abram the Hebrew? Well, he wasn't a Hebrew, but I decided he was. I'm God. Mordecai the Jew. Well, he wasn't a Jew beforehand. God just said, Mordecai the Jew. Now he's a Jew. Which I've noted, you know, the, the, the name Jew comes up. It has nothing to do with Jew. Nothing to do with Judah. Um, it comes up in the exile, and it was in Persia. And uh, if anything, this is how God tells it to me. He didn't give me an absolute answer, but it's a dilution of the Hebrew blood because of intermarriaging that was going on during the exile. I don't know if that's between just tribes or tribes and Assyrians, uh, Persians, whoever. Uh, but in any event, Jew comes more from Hebrew than anywhere. They both end in A.W. And um, those are the words God wanted. And he, you know, he just said, uh, these, these words will identify my people forever. And they have. So, I'm Israelite. I'm definitely not Jewish, but I'm descendant of King David. And that, you know, nobody can have a uh, genealogical record of that. It's because the Spirit of God lit upon me and entered into me, and God is in His Spirit. And so when you see the Spirit, Spirit of God lights upon somebody, and this comes, we learn this in Ezekiel, and particularly the concept God is in Him, uh, but although it shows up in two or three other places. Um, why didn't God have it written that way? Spirit of God that lit upon, uh, alights upon uh, the twig of the shoot that grows from the stump of Jesse. And the stump is all about uh, Jesus because God knew, well, it's a stump because of the banishment of the last king before the Babylon, uh, final Babylon, um, um, well, whenever, whenever they took them away, deportation. Uh, Jeconia, and he was banished from every ruling over Judah again. And, of course, all the, uh, all the kings sat in Benjamin. Benjamin. The lands of Benjamin, which are kind of a divide between uh, Judah, the kingdom of Judah, the kingdom of Israel, sometimes called Samaria. That it's a divide, but uh, Benjamin is considered uh, part of Judah because that's where the kings rule from. But God made it the stump. He knew the Christians were going to use the line of the kings of Judah to get to Jesus. 
And he, I don't know if he actually knew the name would be Jesus. As a matter of fact, it's supposed to be Emmanuel. If they had followed the prophecy, they say prophecy satisfied, and they shall call him Emmanuel, which means God with us, and then they name him Jesus. So, I don't know. You can't, you know, you can't make heads or tails of that religion, other than it's nothing but a human sacrifice cult, if you want to sum it up, of a mythical man named Jesus. A mythical man. And I've got, you, I, I, well, God put forth an argument. This is the only, the only place in the entire book that's not outright backed up by Scripture. A, a statement such as that, that he never existed. That it's just a story that started a hundred years before uh, uh, the Gospels say he was born. Okay, I'm supposed to move on. I guess I am taking too long. Uh, but anyway, so that's why it's a stump. The only ancestral tree we know of from King David through King Solomon. It has to be through King Solomon because they both were given, uh, David was given the Davidic covenant and I guess the Solomonic covenant. I don't know. Anyway, eternal kingships. Um, that, that's all we had. And so that, that got cut down. It got banished. And so a new tree sprouts. And that would be the genealogical tree that I'm a part of. The shoot that grows from the stump, and somewhere down the line, here's a little bitty leaf, a little bitty stem and a leaf, and that's me. And my name would be written on the leaf, Keith. And uh, so I'm part of the uh, genealogical tree that we don't know anything about. But I know who I am because the Spirit of God had lit upon me, entered me, and God is in His Spirit, and God flat out told me, You are descendant. Of King David, you are Israel. You are of the Israelites, and you are an Israelite, as far as I'm concerned. In any event, for those who don't like how God does that, and I guarantee there's someone out there, um, I'm going to be an Israeli citizen one day, which means I'm converting to Orthodox when we get to Jerusalem. Meet some people I want to be converted by. Uh, I started the conversion process here um, at a conservative synagogue, the largest syna uh, conservative synagogue or one of in the world. Great people, but it was God wanted me to experience. Oh, by the way, I didn't tell anybody who I was. I didn't say anything. I didn't walk in and say, hey, I'm Moshe. I mean, <laughs> it's hard enough doing it long distance with these videos. Uh, we didn't say anything, but I went through the high holidays. I learned a lot. I got to know the people. Uh, uh, it was an incredibly great experience, and I'm glad I went through it, but uh, maybe midway through, my father had a heart attack, and he, he went through a quad bypass. He actually survived. I still live with him today. I take care of him and my mom in return for room and board because God had me stop working 13 years ago. And fortunately, I finally started getting some Social Security money here recently on an early filing at 63, just turned 64. But uh, so I'm going to be converting, and I learned that that means I have been a Jew since birth. So that's going to take care of the whole issue. Um, so picking up. I'm having trouble with my, okay, well, I have to take a break and get this fixed, because I can't go on. This is, God's books on here, and I got to have it when I do these videos. <clears throat> okay, I got that fixed. As I mentioned, Moses is a man of divine beings. Uh, and why is that? Because he hears God talking to him. Ezekiel, in Ezekiel, I can't give you the chapter and verse. In Ezekiel, God tells him, 
Ezekiel, or old mortal, I'm not sure which, I think he said Ezekiel, stand up upon your feet. And actually, that happens more than one time. Ezekiel, stand up upon your feet. I've got a side note on that in just a moment. <clears throat> Ezekiel says, at that moment, a spirit entered into me, and I could hear his words. Couldn't hear his words until the spirit entered into him. God is in his spirit. So if God is talking to Moses, and we already know wherever God's presence is, the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit is. So immediately, we know that the Spirit has entered Moses, and God is in his Spirit, and God can and Moses can hear his words. So he's a, he's a man of divine things, which is a host of the Lord's host, according to uh, three verses out of Joshua. Uh, that concerned the captain of the Lord's host, who's a harbinger of me. In those three verses, you find out he's a man in divine beings. Clearly, he's the captain of the Lord's host. He's a host. That's where we learn it. And uh, <clears throat> a harbinger, because it, it is made clear he's a Gentile. It's clear he's a Gentile. And what does he say? What does he say? Now I have come. And we never see him again. That's it. He's a sign. He's a harbinger of something to come. And uh, that's Moshe. Man in the bottom banks. That's me. So, and a Gentile. Uh, as of today. And an Israelite. And if, but in any event, <laughs> I'm going to convert Orthodox. Okay, this is, uh, I have three short stories in, that God dictated that I'm going to go over. And you need to hear that backdrop about Moses. This is called Moses and the Angel. Moses tells the Israelites, oh, this is from Exodus chapter 23, verses 20 and 22. And by the way, uh, when I was talking about the prophet like Moses, I said, uh, what I had was coming from Exodus. I'm not sure about that at all. It, it may be the last book uh, of the Torah. I'm not sure. Moses tells the Israelites that God is here in order to test you and in order that the fear of him may be ever with you. And well, it should. God had Moses set a rule before the Israelites regarding the angel he sent to guard them on the way and to bring them to the place that he had made ready. That's the angel of his presence. I am, sending, <clears throat> I am sending an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have made ready. Pay heed to him and, and obey him. Do not defy him, for he will not pardon your offenses, since my name, which is Hushim, God, since I, my name, is in him. I, I think it's actually the name for Hashem. But anyway, that's what he's saying. I am in him. But if you obey him and do all that I, that I say, obey him, do all that I say. He's not saying they do everything the angel says. It's because they're like this. They're right together. I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. God had Moses set a rule before the Israelites regarding the angel he sent to guard them on the way and to bring them to the place he made ready. There are no orders, instructions, rules, or commandments between an angel and Moses or an angel and the Israelites. Obey him. This, that, that, this. And yet, we don't have a single account of anything coming from the angel. They all come from Moses. Moses, go tell Israelites chapter 2 of Leviticus. <laughs> they all come from Moses who receives them from God. This angel is in Moses. Moses is a man with divine beings who is a messenger of God's laws. The divine beings of God and the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit. 
a man with divine beings is a host of the Lord's host. The descendant of King David that the Spirit of God alights upon is a host of the Lord's host. One God, one angel, and one man. Every prophet of God. Every prophet of God. Because he speaks to his prophets. And if he does, the Spirit enters into them, who is also the angel. You can also, I have a, a much better uh, uh chapter that, that God tells me it, that was set up for me to teach from. Uh, and that's uh, Zechariah chapter 1. And you might recall the phrase uh, a man standing in the myrtles. Okay? That man standing in the myrtles is actually sitting on a horse standing in the myrtles uh, becomes the angel of the Lord in the myrtles when you read it closely. Um, and I, I have a YouTube video on it, and of course it's in the book. And it has to do with a, a, a question. Rashi says, we can't figure this out. It's too enigmatic. It's like a, a dream and a vision. We can't. We ha and here's Rashi, known for saying Isaiah 53 is the people of Israel. You know what he says? We have to wait for the teacher of righteousness to understand what this is. Well, the teacher of righteousness is here. That's Isaiah 53. And uh, I have the answer. I know, I know what it's all about. And it actually ties in to what's happening today. You know, with me and these books and the, and the covenant, uh, the covenant of, that includes sin forgiveness. Okay, the next one is and this is this really goes to a man in divine being spirit entering into you. Moses and Joshua the attendant. Joshua the attendant was named Hoshi in the Exodus. Now this is from uh, Numbers. That's thirteen and six. Joshua the attendant was named Hoshi in the Exodus. From the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshi, son of Nun, Numbers 13 and 6. And his name was changed to Joshua by Moses. Those were the names of the men whom Moses sent to scout the land. But Moses changed the name of Hoshi, son of Nun, to Joshua. Numbers, uh, chapter 13, verse 16. Okay, but here's what's interesting. He's calling him Joshua long before that. He's being called that in the Exodus. Okay, but his name's Hoshi. And he doesn't become Joshua until much later. But in this rendition, you're going to see his name's Joshua. It's supposed to, I, I, I think that's supposed to kind of cue you in to, to think about this. Why, why is that? On the first ascent of Moses... You know, I don't have the chapters and verses. Well, I'm sure y'all are more familiar with it than I am. We don't do, we don't do much toil. God says, my people have just about minced it down to nothing. He says, all the good stuff I hid from them, I pointed out to you. It's just like angel of his presence, Holy Spirit. One time, one time he mentions it in Isaiah 63. <laughs> not supposed to find and, and then you have the captain of the Lord's host three short verses in Joshua you know it's, it's my proof and I, I just posted another uh, video regarding Moses I, I had found it I did it a long time ago found it this morning before I did this one and um, it has to do with the proofs that he took to Egypt to convince 600,000 Israelite slaves to follow him to the promised land. He didn't have much. He didn't have what I had. And it took him one morning. <laughs> I've had this for years. Okay, so, on the first ascent of Moses to the mountain for 40 days and nights in return with the Ten Commandments, his attendant, Joshua, was with him. Joshua made the ascent with him. 
After Moses descended and would enter the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one man speaks to another. That's when he directs your attention to a place in the tent. And you just, you know, okay, this is where I'm to communicate with him. And it makes it better because it's just like there's an invisible man there, invisible person. Um, and it's, it's better than like I just feel like I'm talking out into the air or something. And as one man speaks to another. And he would then <clears throat> return to the camp. But his attendant, Joshua, son of Nun, a youth, would not stir out of the tent. Joshua's name was Hoshi at the time. So Moses goes into the tent, talks to the Lord face to face, and Joshua's right there with him. And then Moses gets up and leaves and Joshua stays. His attendant does not go with him. He stays in there with God. Joshua did not leave the tent of meeting where Moses would speak to God face to face. At this time, the face of Moses was not seen as radiant. When Moses ascends the mountain the second time for 40 days and nights and returns with the Ten Commandments, the skin of his face is radiant. And thereafter, when he enters and exits the tent of meeting, the skin of his face is radiant. And Hoshi, Joshua, is not mentioned again. On the mountain or in the tent, Joshua the attendant, who is Hoshi the attendant, represents the person of the Spirit of the Holy God. The angel of God's presence, who has now alighted upon and dwells within and without, by the way, Moses of the radiant face. That's what the radiant face is. You know, I mean, you can make up all kinds of different interpretations, I suppose. But for what I'm doing with the man and divine beings and showing that includes Moses, um, that's what that was all about. <laughs> you know. It's just symbolic or met, met, no, it's not metaphors. In any event, the next one is Moses and the 70 elders. Yeah, all these stories and everything is going to man and divine beings. Uh, the Spirit of God, angel of his presence, has entered into you, and God is in his spirit, and he's in his angel. This is Numbers, um, chapter 11, verse 17. God tells Moses, <clears throat> I will draw upon the spirit that is on you, on you, and put it upon them. <clears throat> they shall share the burden of the people with you, and you shall not bear it alone. And then God drew upon the spirit that was on him, and put it upon the seventy elders. And when the Spirit rested upon them, they spoke in ecstasy, but did not continue. That's Numbers chapter 11, verse 25. And Moses said of the two elders who were acting the prophet in the camp, speaking in ecstasy, as the Spirit rested on them, would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord put his Spirit upon them. You did become a prophet. Because if his spirit alights upon you, which is an anointment, by the way, uh, God's in him. And from this we know it can be done with 70 people at the same time. That doesn't even come close to what happens in heaven, where God will be the information of your mind. And Moses said to the two elders who were acting the prophets in the camp, oh, cover that, that was Numbers chapter 11, Verse 25. Okay. The spirit that was drawn from Moses and put upon the 70 elders is not the spirit that was born in Moses and that was Moses. The same spirit that is in all men. What was drawn from Moses was the spirit of God. And the spirit of God is a person. The first person created by God. 
The seventy elders had become hosts of the Lord's host, men and divine beings, with the purpose of God that they shared the burden of the people with Moses. When each heard the angelic voice of the Spirit of God speak to them, within them or without them, it can be as though just to your mind from within, most often it's from without me. In other words, you know, it's like a great cloud. Uh, I tried to explain this before. That the sins upon you, okay, so wherever I go, this, this great cloud is, this presence that we can't see, God's presence and the presence of the angel. If I were in a room and 20 people were seated, that presence would surround them. Like a cloud would descend upon you right now, it would just surround you. It wouldn't penetrate your skin. That's the difference with me. It flows through me. It's as though my skin and bones and body, you know, it just it goes straight to my spirit. My spirit is jumbled up in, in those, you know, God, angel, me. Uh, of course, my spirit is the same as the spirit of God as, as far as the elements that it is comprised of. Um... But I'm still just, you know, I'm still Keith. I, I'm not three people or anything. It feels like it sometimes. It's certainly not any kind of a trinity. God is God. You know, it, it's just the composition of the unseen, um, the heavenly realm of God, if you will. That's just, uh, that's how it's done. And this is how he communicates to the world. And no, the Jewish people in Judaism don't know this. It's another proof of mine, and I can back it up with these little things, these little stories here and there. I backed up a, a, my inter a commentary on Isaiah 53 with Ezekiel. Nobody's ever done that, but it fits perfect. You can't deny it. Explains what all those words are. He was wounded for our sins. What does that mean? You know, we're not supposed to have vicarious suffering in Judaism. It's all explained. It's not a problem. Oh, and the angelic voice of the Spirit of God. God's voice is, is, is just like an adult. Uh, but, but the angel, you know, they like me to say, say he sounds like a five-year-old. Uh, uh, just a, a young, 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 young person. But um, to me, it's more like you turn on cartoons and listen to one of those voices, and they're just different from a five-year-old. To me, it's too human. And he's not human by any stretch of the imagination. But he has an angelic voice, and it sounds, uh, it's wonderful to hear. I mean, he's my best friend in the world. I don't have any other friends. I've been taken from society in the world uh, for 13 years now. But, uh, yeah, he's my best friend, and God's my master, and I, I'm his servant. Um, uh, he's, he's my king, and I'm a serf out in the kingdom, the realm. Okay, so, when each heard the angelic voice of the Spirit of God speak to them, in them or without them, they became very excited and were saying all kinds of different things depending on what the person of the Spirit of God was saying to them. Chiefly, we know he's saying, y'all got to help Moses. But, you know, he's a real cut-up. I mean, he'll make you laugh. He'll get you excited and talking loud. And <laughs> yeah, that's That's... You know, he's a necessary party for God to put a prophet, a man, into the fire of refinement. Believe me, you need him there. It's like good cop, bad cop. <laughs> That's what it's like. <clears throat> the important part for Moses is that each of the 70 would now, in one accord, have the idea and thought that they would share the burden of the people with Moses. Now, there's no account of God commanding the 70 to share the burden of the people with Moses, but they did. And they did it based on the Spirit of God telling them to. And, of course, God's there. The Spirit of God can't do anything without God because he has no power. No angel has power. God is the sole power of the unseen realm of heaven. Uh, he's the sole power. He does not create uh, an angel, you know, you read, and this most, mostly came from 
Christianity, the archangel, the fallen angel, Satan, uh, this and that, and you know, I've heard Christians talk about great armies that, that fight good in the celestial, in the heavenly realm. Uh, no, God's it. You know, he's, he's the power. Now, he can, if he sends an angel on a mission to do something in particular, which would be a rarity if I can't even think of one, but if he did, he, he, he basically would send, he, his presence would go with that angel and, and he would have the power. Uh, it would be God's power. But he'd be doing it for the angel and whatever he was supposed to do. So, that's more about Moses from the Torah, coming from Mashiach, the Gentile atheist of 50 years, that has never been seen. I'm quite certain because I know Judaism doesn't recognize the Spirit of God as a person. And they never talk about the angel of his presence. So I know they don't have any of this. Um... Again, a greater proof of who I am and that these words are true. And it all fits. And I got back up. I got, you know, God just left little acorns here and there. <laughs> you know, every pig gets an acorn now and then. I think it's pig. I don't know. But anyway, um, thank you for listening.